Book Buzz, Harper Collins Book Buzz. Check it out. Do 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 do. Book Buzz, Harper Collins Book Buzz. Brought to you by Library Love Fest. We have our own intro. Isn't that cool? Is everybody there? Hello. Oh my God. We actually have our own introduction. It's like <laughs> pretty cool. It's very official. <laughs> official. Super <So>. cool. <laughs> Everyone, welcome back to, I suppose this is episode two of the Library at Love Fest uh, Galley Club. We're so excited to have you here and so excited to talk about uh, this new program that we have. Uh, last week, we um, we announced this new program, the Library Love Fest Galley Club. Um, every month, we're going to announce a new title that we feel lends itself well to discussion and conversation. And so, we're going to pick some chewy books, and we've got a we've got a wonderful book to talk about today. So, we announced it last week, um, and we can put that jacket up there right now, so that you can all see the book that we just we've chosen: "Remarkably Bright Creatures." by Shelby Van Pelt. This is the inaugural selection of the Library Love Fest Galley Club. So uh, as I say, the first, the first uh, Tuesday of the month, we're going to announce it. We're also gonna talk about some other bu uh, books. We're gonna buzz books as well. Um, and then we're making the, we've made the e-galley and or the advanced listeners copy available to you so you can start reading. The following week, you're gonna meet uh, various members from the um, team that worked on the book. And um, it's a great opportunity to just find out about the publishing process. If you have questions, ask them because they are here to share what they know. Um, and they're people who have worked on this book and um, discovered it and made a dream a reality, which is really, really wonderful. And then the third week, next Tuesday, uh, you're going to get to meet the author of this book, Shelby Van Pelt. So come with your questions and your comments. And uh, we're just super excited to talk about this book. It's a, it's a fabulous debut novel about a, a widow and an unlikely friendship that she has with a, a curmudgeonly giant Pacific octopus reluctantly residing at a local aquarium and a mysterious grifter who comes to town and truths are unlocked about her son's disappearance 30 years ago. We are not alone in our love for this book. Uh, Essie, I believe we have some lovely quotes. Cynthia Diapri Sweeney, author of uh, Good Company and the Nest, raving about this book. I love this quote, the rarest of feats, a book that manages to be wry and wise, charming and surprising, features one of the most intriguing and satisfying characters I've encountered in fiction in a very long time. Marcel is the octopus, couldn't agree more. Uh, we also have a quote from Kevin Wilson, um, author of many books, including Nothing to See Here, which is another book where you have to suspend belief and go with the story, because that's the story of all these stories, just love and heart and friendship and family. Um, and he is a huge fan, and I love this quote, a beautiful examination of how loneliness can be transformed, cracked open with the slightest touch from another living thing. So today we're talking with two people from Echo Press who will share their experiences uh, discovering and working on this book. We have Helen Atzma, VP Editor and Publisher, and Miriam Parker, VP Associate Publisher. And we're going to bring them on now and we're going to talk to them about this wonderful, beautiful book. Hello. Hello, Virginia. Hi. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Helen. How Hi. are you? Hi. I'm great. That intro just kind of, it's like you had singers on that. I know, right? <laughs> I know. Wait, Virginia, is that you? Is that you singing your barbershop quartet? <laughs> Absolutely not. But that's such a great idea. And I plan to do that. You just give me another idea. <laughs> I do sing oh. along with it, though. I can't help it. Um, it's catchy. Isn't it fun? Our wonderful ad promo department uh, put that together for us. So um, anyway, thank you both for joining us today to talk about this incredible book. Um, before we start, I just want to talk, I just want to do a, a very brief intro for both of you, and then I'm going to just have a chat. And folks, bring your questions. 
for Helen and Miriam. So Helen Atzma, publisher, joined Echo in 2019. You oversee the Echo team and the list. And for your own list, you acquire literary and book club fiction, hello, um, along with memoir and some narrative uh, nonfiction. You've worked with authors such as Ramon Alam, Elizabeth McCracken, Natasha Trethaway, to name a few. These are all library favorites. And so um, it's nice just to give people sort of a, you know, sort of a sense of what books you work on and what authors you are, um, uh, you know, just working with. Um, and Miriam Parker, VP Associate Publisher, been with Echo in, uh, started in 2015, and 15 years working in, at Hachette. Um, and your authors include Anthony Bourdain and Amy Tan, uh, Louise Gluck, Charles Frazier, Jose Andres. Uh, you know, you both bring so much um, experience and information um, and insight to the table. And so I, honestly, thank you both so much for for coming today to talk to us about um, the publishing experience and this book in particular. So without further ado, let's get into it. Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt, which goes on sale in May. Um, Helen, do you wanna start first by talking a little bit about the discovery of this book? Absolutely, and thank you for those lovely introductions. Um, and it's so fun to be here. We love librarians. I, I love libraries. I love the readers that all of um, the librarians I know are. I know you guys do so much to go to the mat and champion our books and hopefully this one, but but so many more. So, so thank you for spending your time listening to this. Um, you know, one of the things I love about this book is that it, it, it's had what I would call a very like pure path to publication. And I think sometimes people outside of the publishing industry think, oh, you know, if you don't do an MFA or if you're not like living in New York City or you don't know a million people or you're not on Twitter or Instagram and like connected in that way, like you're never going to break in. Like you're never like, how, how are you even going to get published? And I think there's a real sense of like this impenetrable shield that is publishing and um and and the things that editors are looking for and i have writers who have come from all of those backgrounds from mfas who live in new york but also i'm working with shelby van pelt and and this is a story of a woman who i think you know wanted to write but she didn't do an mfa um, she had some friends in her writing group her local writing group and <laughs> during covid with two small kids at home she like banged out a novel. Um, she was taking a writing class, I believe, and she'll talk more about this next week, but there was a writing prompt that made her think all of a sudden about a talking octopus and um, or not a talking octopus, but about an octopus living in, in an aquarium and stories of her childhood, um, thinking about her grandmother uh, who had immigrated from Sweden when she was a girl um, and had this very kind of stoic adulthood, if you will, um, living in Washington state. All those things came together for her. So Shelby wrote this book. She didn't know any agents, but she admired Kristen Nelson, who um, is now her agent. And she sent it to her cold, basically. And I think Kristen's assistant like read the pitch and thought, oh, that sounds interesting and flagged it for Kristen, who read it. And I think they did maybe a small little round of edits. And six weeks later, Kristen went out with it. It came into my inbox. Um, and I immediately thought, oh, this, this, it sounds different. It's, it just sounds, it, it sounds, you know, really different. My inbox is flooded with submissions. I think I get over 300 a year and I acquire maybe six books a year. So the bar is really high, although that makes it sound like I'm some incredible snob, but I'm not. I lose a lot of auctions. There are some books that are just not right for Echo. Like there's a lot of reasons that it, it might not be right for me, but it's of course going to be right for another house or another editor. But um, what I've been telling people about this book is that if you read the first page, I think you will know very quickly if this is a book for you or not. And I read, you know, Marcellus has this opening page and his charming, acerbic, wry voice just immediately captivated me. I just thought this is, I haven't read anything like this. And then I went on this journey, which is really a story of a woman who is at a crossroads in her life, who is mourning the, the loss of her husband a few years ago, still mourning the loss of her son 30 years ago, still confused really as to as to how he died exactly. He died in, in what seemed to be like a boating accident, but it's very mysterious. He was a teenager. Um, she's She doesn't really need the money, but she has a job at a local aquarium just to kind of have something to do. And it is there that she meets Marcellus, the octopus, but also a larger community of people in that town. And I put this book down and I just thought, this is a book about second chances. 
And this is a book about hope. And this is a book about reconnecting with your past in a way that helps you look forward. Um, and my goodness, in the middle of COVID and, you know, then and, and now and the time we're in, it just, um, you know, it just really spoke to me and it spoke to everybody else in town, like everybody wanted this book. <laughs> so this could have been a sad story, but we prevailed in the auction. And, you know, it's amazing. Shelby, I think this book is now going to be published in 10 other countries as well. I mean, her life has really... <laughs> She's had she's had a real moment in the last year, um, and and I think another one when when it, the book you know when when all of you read it and when a larger audience reads it when it publishes. So um, there's no one way to get published. It, it happens all kinds of ways, but this is a particularly fun one, and it comes purely out of love for the read. That's so wonderful. We were just saying before, like not only is the story so wonderful, but the story of how this book came to be is so wonderful. You know, I mean, it's 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 quite different. Um, so thank you for the background on that, Helen, because I, th and I also think that, you know, who doesn't have a book in them? So try, try, because you never know. Um, but I love that. Now, and Miriam, so um, do you wanna talk about the lead read? This book um, is our lead read for the summer. Do you wanna talk about that uh, campaign and, Again, this book goes from being a debut to the lead read. It's a big yeah. deal. It's a huge deal. And so first I'll say, you know, the other thing about when the book, you know, when Helen gets a book in, you know, she, the first thing she does is she reads it and then she sort of sends it around to the group at Echo. Um, and we, you know, fell in love with the book. And I think we also were like, this is the perfect book for Echo. You know, we publish literary fiction. Um, we publish some, you know, sort of commercial fiction, which I think this sort of straddles that line. But we also publish a lot of, really fun science writing at Echo. And we had just published a book called The Book of Eels, which was a nonfiction book about the story of eels. And so we were like very high on like slightly obscure animals. And so <laughs> when we got in a novel about an octopus, we were like, oh, this is like exactly the, like right in the wheelhouse of what we can do. We love, you know, great stories, um, but we also love animals and we love, you know, um, you know, we love to like kind of get inside the mind of an animal, whether it's nonfiction or fiction. So but the team really got excited about it. And I think that passion also, I, I hope, you know, convinced Shelby that we were the right publisher for her. Um, and I think once we won the book, then we were able, and Helen edited it, and it was, you know, kind of in a finished form, then we were able to kind of go out and like, find the members of our larger publishing community at HarperCollins and say, like, you've got to read this book. It's so good. Um, and I think, you know, what's been really lovely to see is the way that our whole company has kind of gotten behind this book, you know, um, early readers, you know, some of the people in our sales department, um, you know, you guys in the library division, you know, you know, get a hold of the manuscript early and then like start spreading the word about it. So something happened that actually I've never seen happen before, which is that we have a series of meetings um, where we pitch our books to you, to the sales team, um, and you guys go away and then do the work after that. And, but at one of our meetings, our Barnes and Noble rep, Kate, just got up and pitched this book before Helen had pitched it. And she was like, I love this book. It's so good. And like, basically like gave Helen's pitch for the book to sales before Helen could tell them about it. So like, even, you know, our enthusiasm had kind of spilled over. I kind of had slipped it to a couple of people and their enthusiasm kind of welled up out of, you know, out of the, the sea really to, um, to really spread the word. And so that is what kind of like snowballed the book into the lead read program. So the lead read program is a is a program where every season at HarperCollins, one book is selected by the sales force, not influenced by the publishers as the book that they want to champion, you know, sort of above all else. Um, and this season, you know, they read a lot of submissions and they, they, so also they have inboxes filled with manuscripts and this was the one that kind of got the most votes. So, um, so really, really proud of that because it means that not only did we love it at Echo and felt, felt it was the perfect book for Echo, but also that the sales team came together and said, this is the perfect book for HarperCollins to like really, you know, just bring out into the world in a really fun way. So, and again, like, you know, it's, it's all in the read and that's what's been really nice about it. Yeah. I remember being at that meeting and hearing Kate go crazy. It was just like, wait, what is this one? <laughs> It's really infectious, you know, when you, when that sort of thing happens, you know, you just, your ears perk up because it's, uh, you know, it's touching, it's touched a lot of uh, 
it's just touched nerves. It's just, it's beautiful, you know? And so forget about the talking octopus, forget about Kevin Wilson and his kids that go on fire. Just forget about all that and read the book and, and be so glad you did, you know? Um, okay, so we have tons of questions in the inbox. And so we'll get to those in the chat room. Um, but, to, and they may even be, these questions may even be in there, but I'm just gonna jump the, jump the line. Um, before we get to the questions, but um, two things I want to talk, I want, would love you to talk about is, and this has been um, asked um, when we first announced the book, people were like, you've got to tell us about this jacket. This is beautiful. This is arresting. So can you talk about that jacket art? We, we can. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. So I mean, it's beautiful. I will just remind people of how it's a, it's a hand painted watercolor jacket um, with beautiful lettering. We are privileged to have two amazing designers who work exclusively on the Echo List. Um, and the jacket process, I'll tell you, it can be a real journey <laughs> in some cases where you end up looking at 20 covers and none of them are quite right before you land on the final one. Um, but in this case, it just came together seamlessly. Um, Vivian Rowe had joined Echo not too long, I think, but this is one of her first books, I think, that she did um, uh, for our list. And she is not only a jacket designer, but she's an illustrator um, she, and a painter. And she kind of had a vision um, for for how this should, should look. So we, we meet weekly, basically, to go over um, all of our covers and kind of all at different stages. With some books we're talking about here, the, the the books we're thinking about, we describe, we pitch them a bit to our design team. They've read the manuscript. You know, we're talking about what the look should be. Other times we're, we're seeing sketches. Sometimes we're seeing what we hope will be the finished cover before we share with the author and the agent. In this case, Vivian came to one of those meetings and she had a sketch, like, a you know, I think a pencil drawing basically of this cover. And, and we just thought, oh, this is, this, this feels exactly right. And, you know, like the next meeting, I think she had painted it and um, it needed some color adjustments and a few, you know, there were a few pieces of seaweed, I think that had to be moved around, but um, uh, that was perfectly right. And then we shared it with the author and the agent and they loved it. And so it was just kind of one vision from the beginning and it was Vivian's genius vision um, that, that saw it through. And look, this is tricky, this cover a little bit. It looks easy now, but think about it. You, you're, you're wanting to, you want something that looks warm and beautiful and upmarket um, that's also showing a relationship between a woman and an octopus. And that could, that look could go a lot of different directions. But I think, um, I think Vivian really captured the spirit of the book with her ingenious um, design. Yeah. Uh, can Essie or Lainey, can you show the jacket again? I know it's in the, in the comments section, but maybe just because we could take a, a quick look at it up close. It's just gorgeous. It's so beautiful. And it yeah. looks good. You know, we're always we're thinking like, well, this is going to look good on shelves face out, you know, at libraries where you'll have it displayed for your new fiction for readers. Um, is it going to look good on tables in bookstores? Is it going to look good um, at smaller size on, on the screen um, for people who are who are shopping online? So you're kind of thinking of ways the different ways the cover will be used and will look. And this one just, I think, is so successful on every level. That's really beautiful. Love it. Um, okay, and then the one other thing I'd like to talk about or ask you to talk about, um, and then we'll hop to the questions, is the audiobook. Now, last week when we announced the book, we also played a short clip from the very beginning of the book. Um, Michael Yuri is the voice of Marcellus. We didn't get to Marin um, Ireland, who, who, um, but we we just got to Michael Yuri because that's the beginning of the book. And I thought what was really interesting is that so many people have told us this last week that um, they're not audiobook people, and they're they're completely <laughs> sold just because of the four minutes that we played. So we put that link in there for anyone who um, didn't get to hear it last time. And um, it's quite something. So um, do you want to talk about that a second before we go to the questions? Hey, Miriam, do you want to maybe take that? Sure. So um, 
we obviously um, love audiobooks, um, and we have an amazing audio team. And actually, I meet with them every season um, to just go through, you know, what's cooking on our list. And so this was one actually that I would think I was meeting with them about the winter 2022 list. And when I was telling them about the winter 2022 list, I was like, I just want you to know that we have this coming up in the summer. Um, and I love this book. And I, I actually flagged to them so that I thought Marin Ireland would be perfect for it. Um, because we've, she's read, she read Nothing to See Here and Good Company. Um, both of whom, both the authors had responded to the book and, you know, and, and loved it. And, you know, she's just such a good reader and she's really, there's something that's just really like sensitive about her voice. And I think she does these types, she does character really well. And this book is, the character is so important. So I had just said to Suzanne, who is our audio producer, like my personal dream is that we would have her in Ireland. Um, Suzanne is awesome. And she was like, okay, let me see what I can do. And then she went away and she came back and she was like, not only do I have her in Ireland, but I also have Michael to do the Marcellus parts. And I, I think, I assume, I think she might've come to you about that, Helen, I don't know. But we were like, this is, um, this is amazing. It's such, a, it's so, so, so perfect. <laughs> um, and I think actually, I mean, I think a lot of people actually came to, Ke Kevin Wilson, Nothing to See Here was the first audiobook that Marin Ireland read for Echo. And I think a lot of people came to that book because of the audiobook. It's actually won a number of awards and, and I think has sort of skyrocketed her to be, you know, a, a, an audiobook all-star. So now, you know, we're, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's competitive to get her to read the books. And so I'm, I'm really actually honored that she was, you know, that she was able to say yes and that Suzanne was able to get Michael to do the Marcellus parts because, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of audiobooks. There's, you know, there's a lot of competition for the good readers and, um, and she's such a star. So I, I'm just so excited that she said yes. <laughs> we, we were all thrilled. And, and typically the process is um, our, our amazing audio team, they'll share like a list of narrators with the author and the agent and the author can rank their preferences. And in this case, it's, a, you know, it's a dual narrator approach. So it's a little different and not everyone would match perfectly too. Um, and I'll be honest, sometimes there's, more conversation about it. But I think in this case, Suzanne was like, these are the two. And everyone was like, yeah, obviously go see if you can get them. And if, if not, then we'll have a larger discussion. But, um, but Shelby com was completely excited by the idea. Ah, it's so good. And they both, yeah. And, and nothing to see here, uh, read by Marin Ireland is like, oh my God, this is so good. How does she do this? I mean, I know she's this wonderful actress who just saw her in a play a couple of months ago. It risked the COVID to go to a play because she was in it, but she's amazing. And um, the nuance, unbelievable. So, okay. Um, I think we should get to the questions. Lainey, we have, we have so many people who are here and listening. So I think Lainey and Essie, we should get to it. Unless I've missed anything. I don't know if I have. I don't think so. No. Um, let's see. So there, Amy White said this was her first audio galley ever. And she was so intrigued by that reading. Um, yeah, there's a lot of like, I just finished it. It was incredible. I love this book, the subject matter, the character and the relationships. Um, and then there were a few questions about the cover. Let me get to that. So someone said, well, I guess before we get to the cover, uh, Kim McGee said, how do you find a fantastic debut author? Did you get chills when you read it and knew that you wanted it immediately? I think you talked about it, but if there's anything else you want to say to that question, it was posed. I think I'm always looking for something that feels new. And that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean a kind of writing I haven't seen before. It can be the story in this case. Um, I haven't seen this done before um, about a, a woman um, becoming friends with an octopus, but, but also things that tap into the universal. And in this case, I think this feeling of like, can you have a second chance? What happens when you feel like you've reached the end of your rope and is there a, a path forward from there? Um, so often, you know, Echo has a very diverse list. I'm always looking for voices that are bringing me to a cultural experience um, or a country I haven't seen before or bringing me there in a way I haven't seen before. So I think that like the newness is the, for me and, and I think for most of the Echo team, kind of the exciting um, 
the exciting thing. Um, and it can present itself in a lot of different ways, but there's, there's this point where I kind of sit up. And in this case, again, it happened kind of on the first page. And Helen, I feel like the other thing about this book is there's like a comfort to it. And I think yes. we've all been going through just yes. a hard few years. <laughs> a hard and like, few years, guys. <laughs> and like books, you know, when you can find a book that just like gives you a hug, I think this book is that. And that's something that's so lovely about it. And I think, you know, we read it a year ago and felt that way. And, you know, we still need a hug. So, um, so I think that's that experience of reading this book is is really important. And um, I'm so glad it's coming out, you know, soon for, for everyone to experience that. Like you'll give it to your mother and your sister and your friend. And I can't think of someone I actually wouldn't give this book to. I just think it's, um, it's and so actually, special. There aren't that many books that are about older characters. I mean, you know, Tova's in her seventies, you know, she's, you know, she's lived a really long life and, and has, you know, I think that that's unique. And I think it's an experience that, you know, that I think, I, th I don't know. I just think it's like something that you don't read about often in fiction yep. and I, again, you know, not every book has to be about a 28 year old, you know, having, you know, like figuring out her life. Like it's nice to have, you know, to have that a different voice in that way too. Absolutely. We, we have a lot of like the, I'm lost in New York city novels and I love them, but this really, I think, um, you're right, Miriam. Absolutely. It speaks, it, it, it speaks to a different stage in life and does it so beautifully. And a wider yeah. readership. I think you calling it a hug, like a book that hugs you is great. It's an eight armed hug. It's perfect. <laughs> it's, um, I just, I did have a question from Jennifer Winberry. Um, I know you guys touched on this a little bit already with the audiobooks, but she would like to know more about the audiobook narr narrator selection process. In her own words, Michael Yuri has a long suffering tone, which is just so perfect. I think that's like the great, a great way to explain it. How did you find the perfect voices or how do you find the perfect voices for these characters? Well, I, I think Miriam touched on that a bit already. Our, um, you know, our producers have amazing relationships with like the best audio readers um, today. It's funny, a, a lot of writers initially think maybe they want to read their audiobook, And I think certainly there are times like with memoir or certain kinds of books where it can be helpful, but it is such an hard thing to do. I think people don't realize like when you listen to a recording of yourself and like the weird swallowing sounds all of us make and all the ums we interject even into reading, you know, printed text. Um, it's it's a hard, grueling work actually. And and um, and, and these people are pros. So our, again, it, it starts with the producer having an idea of, of who would be great. Typically then going to the author and the editor um, with a list of five options often or more even and discussion and ranking and maybe saying oh no I'd rather not include this person at all and then seeing who's available you know and again like Miriam said like some like Marin Ireland is highly sought after you cannot always book her because she's busy um and um but if things come together then it's it's really good so really I, all credit though goes to the our audio team I think they're incredible yeah um and then I think, so Miriam, you touched on this of like, what makes an Echo book? But we did have a question from Janet Lockhart that said, what, uh, does Echo have an, a usual type of book, which maybe you can elaborate some more, but um, I think, I think of the imprint as leaning towards character centered books with an emphasis on language. Is that how you think of it? I like that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Um, we publish a, a real mix. You know, we publish about half fiction, half nonfiction. Um, we publish some poetry. We, we publish an occasional cookbook, you know, when we feel inspired by it. Um, and for us, it is, I mean, it's about storytelling. It's about language. It's about, but it's also about our team and what we read as a group and what we respond to um, and what we think we can publish the best. Um, we are, it's a really team centered approach, both within Echo and with our the authors and agents that we publish. And so um, our, co our conversations and our meetings are often about like, can we do a really good job at this? And we only really, you know, the editor brings books to the wider team. And then the team kind of says like, we can do this. We know how to publish this book. And that's when I think it, it all comes together super well. Um, and I do think it's about storytelling and it's about quality, but it's also about just an alchemy of 
story, book, author, and team. And Helen, you might want to add. Yeah, I think you I think you captured it perfectly. It's a it's an eclectic list. It is it does lean literary absolutely. I would say it's a diverse list. I'd say it's kind of a forward thinking list. Um, but that approach, we're a small team with a small list, you know, comparatively to other imprints in the industry. And it's really the way we publish that um, that makes it a very non cookie cutter approach, which means our books aren't cookie cutter either. <laughs> um, so. Uh, but it, it, it's, it, I think it starts with the writing and then if it feels like a match of subject matter and then team passion, that's something we'll, we'll try and take on. Yeah, um, your, your books are just so wonderful and we, it's always so exciting to hear what you're launching next and it does cover the range and all of it is just, yeah, it doesn't need to be quantity, it's quality and it's just so lovely. We just so love working with you. Um, with your team and um, and working on this book is a real joy. It's a real it's a real joy for us. Um, it's fun to work on a book. It's fun to work on a book like like Kevin Wilson's like this book, you know, where it's like, what is this book? What? And then you get people to read it and they just go, oh my God. I mean, the comments in this in the chat are just like, I've already read it. Oh my God, I love this book so much. Um, one person, Nicole uh, Williams said, I know we are not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but I would pick this book up just because of its beautiful cover. How lovely. Um, this, is, this is my first octopus book, but I felt like I knew him and I now I look at animals and wonder how I appeared to them. That could make me cry. That's from Kimberly McGee. You know, I, I think um, too, what will happen next week is that we're going to have Shelby Van Pelt on who will talk about the book. And I, so, you know, I, I love that people are asking questions about narration and jacket and process and all of that, because all of that is so interesting to me too. And I've been in book business for a long time, but I find it fascinating and refreshing, especially because of the enthusiasm that both of you are bringing to this and this really interesting, unique backstory, this, this, this woman who just had the story to tell and, I, and next week, because we know a little bit more than you all know about uh, why she wrote this book, how she came to write this book. She has a PowerPoint presentation. You know, it's just this really cool, like add on sort of visual that gives you a full sense of, of where her head was at when she was writing this book, you know, and what her history is. And she's really so lovely. Uh, she spoke at a book list webinar and, um, and uh, she's just wonderful. So I'm really excited to have her on next week for you all to meet her and to, um, to ask her questions about the book or anything else that you wanna ask her. Just be forewarned that um, there will be, there may be spoilers, spoiler alert, you never know, but you know, you've got time between, you know, now and next Tuesday to read the book and or listen to it. The advanced listeners copy is available. So, um, there's plenty of ways to get this book into your head and your heart. And then I can't wait to have that conversation with her. So, and you all. So I think, um, because we have a couple of books that we want to talk about um, from Echo. So we want to leave time for that. Um, so if we don't have any other questions for Helen or Miriam, um, I think, uh, Lainey or Essie, if, am I missing anything? I just, um, yeah, uh, go ahead. I think the quote from, or not quote, but Vicky Nesting said when you guys were describing the Echo imprint, no wonder I love Echo books. That description fits what I look for in a good book, which is so true. Oh, so thank true. you. Lainey, anything? Yeah, I think we've pretty, pretty much got to everything um, in some form or fashion, if not directly when we did the talk. So, Think we're good and a lot of people are already noodling on some questions for shelby so she's so great fun. don't don't miss she i i adore her and you know i what i think one of the things you guys should ask her is about all the research she did because even though we could say there's an imaginative element to <laughs> marcellus and his voice she really wanted to get like the biology of it correct um and all of her experience with different aquariums so um she'll give you a lot of food for thought 
I have a quick question for you, uh, for both of you. Um, so when you when you got the manuscript and you read it and you read Marcellus and you had Marcellus's voice in your head, and then you heard Michael Yuri's voice, did that match up with what you had envisioned or what you had heard or, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think for me it did. I think so. Um, the other thing that I thought about a lot when I was reading the book, and this is a non-echo book, but I'll just give it a little plug, is um, a book called The Soul of the Octopus by Cy Montgomery, yeah. um, which like if you like that would be like, you know, if I was going to like give a supplemental reading list, I would say like if you find Marcellus to be interesting or charming, like that book is cool because it just teaches you all the amazing things about octopuses that they're truly remarkable. They truly are remarkably bright creatures. <laughs> so truly. Um, I think um, that book really, I had read that book before I read this and it was very cool to read a novel mm. and like mm. have all the things that I knew about octopuses in my head from having read that one. So um, if you haven't read it, just a little plug for that one too. Right. And she talks about that, uh, right? When she, and it's sort of, sort of some of her, her research a little bit. So yeah, it'd be great to talk to her next week. We're looking forward to it. I thank think you for having us. Oh my goodness. Thank you both. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Miriam, for coming on and, and talking to everybody about uh, this really unique, beautiful read and congratulations. And thank you for bringing it to us and to all readers. So thanks everyone. Thank you librarians for all you thank do. You. Thank you for reading and loving Thank this Thank you book. for reading. We love it. <laughs> we love it. Bye. Right. Well, take care. Bye. Thank you. Everyone needs to stay on because we're going to talk about some Echo books real quick. Okay. So, whoo, that was cool. Oh, my God. Wow. It's actually working. <laughs> All right. Uh, how are we doing? We had 20 minutes. That was amazing. Yeah. Like I said, already good questions. I'm responding to people like, bring that for Shelby. It's going to, yeah. the amount of rabbit hole videos on octopus like undoing puzzles underwater i went down just look it up you're gonna have so much fun talking to shelby next week really wow yeah. okay um well that's great thank you all for hanging out and for listening and learning i think it's always uh we learn stuff too i mean it's it's cool it's really cool so uh what we're going to do is just very quickly um talk about a couple of books because we know that you've got your time is limited and so as much as we are all excited about remarkably bright creatures uh, we want to tell you about a few other books too so we're going to do that no we're not going to do it. next week is just going to be all shelby so it's going to be first tuesday is going to be the announcement and a buzz second week today Staff members talking about what went into that book, a buzz. Third week, author. Author talking about, author answering all your questions. So the coolest book club ever, because it's a galley club and it's pre-pub and you get to meet the author. Okay, let's do it. Oh, touch. So we have a handful of books that we are going to discuss right now. Um, uh, hang on one second. So, Touch. This is um, a story about one man's search to find um, a lover who had suddenly disappeared decades before. This is uh, coming out in August. It's off Olafsson. And um, he, this author was born in, um, in Iceland. It's, it's a panoramic story about a restaurateur late in life, Christopher, and his search for Miko, his lover from decades past, who suddenly makes contact as the pandemic begins to upend the world. COVID propels her to reach out, and he decides to make a trip to see her, and the story unfolds from there. It's a heart-wrenching love story and, and an absorbing mystery, too. So um, this is a Touch, and it comes out in August. And I'm going to go quickly because I know we Okay, and then fruit punch. One moment, please. Okay, um, this is a debut memoir by a buzzy literary writer who Jason Reynolds calls a genius. So this is Kendra Allen's book, uh, Fruit Punch, comes out in July. And it follows on the heels of winning the Iowa Prize for Literary Fiction and the release of her debut volume, volume of poems, The Collection Plate, which received praise from Essence and Time and Refinery and oh my goodness, everywhere. That was out in 2021. Um, it was called one of the most complete writers we have ever read. So this is, um, this is a memoir of growing up in Dallas in the 90s and early 2000s and is about um, a very complicated loving family that is marked by trauma and it plays out 
um, in uh, undercurrents of violence and turmoil. Her account of growing up Black in uh, the South illuminates the complex interplay of race, class, and gender that proves to be ever shifting ground. It's vibrant, it's funny, it's incisive. It's a one of a kind memoir that marks the continuing evolution of a singular new voice. That's Fruit Punch by Kendra Allen coming out in July. So those are my two books from Echo. And Lainey and Essie, you've got some books yourselves. Yeah, I have Mother Ocean, Father Nation. All right, I'm gonna try to do this succinctly, but I don't know if I can, because I really, I really love this book. Um, hi, everyone. This is a debut novel by Nishant Bhatsha, uh, Bhatsha, who holds a PhD in history with a focus on Indian indentured servitude in British colonies. So if there's anyone who could shine a spotlight on this deeply disturbing, albeit deeply fascinating and not very explored historical era, this is your guy. Mother Ocean, Father Nation is the story of two siblings facing the same destruction of their home, but taking two completely pa different paths out of it. So in other words, one is forced to leave and the other gets left behind. So I just I just want to try to paint like a picture here. Place yourself on a small Pacific island. It's 1985 and a breaking news bulletin has just announced that an Indian grocer uh, has been attacked by nativists aligned with the recent military coup. So just with that, you can imagine the fear and the shock that must have rippled through the streets as people realize that the island's deeply rooted uh, racial tensions have boiled over. You can put yourself in the shoes of Biumi. Um, you're young, you're ambitious, you're the intellectual standout of your family. In other words, you're the one who's going to make it, um, but your friendship with the daughter of a prominent government official has become a liability, and now you have to flee overnight from this life that you've built for yourself, possibly forever. So if that's a little difficult to imagine, you could try putting yourself in the shoes of her brother, Japal. Um, you feel you, you are unremarkable. You are um, working in your family's store, you're trying to navigate your father's anger and also the underground queer community of your island. And it's just, your life is a little bit of a mess, but you know what, you got a plan and you can leave and you're funding it. And then all of a sudden it backfires. And just like that, you find yourself stuck in this increasingly violent and volatile country. So how do you, how do you break out of it? How do you find the inspiration or the motivation to keep on going through a total crisis when the nation is broken and all this harsh racial discrimination is just what used to be home? Um, all right, I know that sounds really dark and intense, but these characters are as real as if you could just talk to them or pick up the phone and call them. It's just their flesh and blood on the page and their stories are moving and immersive and completely different. It's the road not taken and we get to see what happens on both sides and how it all ends. Because at the end of it, this is just a story of making it home wherever that is. Um, that's Mother Ocean, Father Nation that comes out June 7th. I'll put a link so you guys could download the e-galley. And I just, I really hope you take a moment to read this incredible, incredible story. That's my book from Echo. Hi, so Take No Names by Daniel Nia. So this is a new thriller from the author of Beijing Paycheck. Uh, that was a PBS NewsHour book club pick um, with the New York Times. Um, and that was his debut. So this is a sequel but it can be read as a standalone. Um, it, it was described to me as Ocean's Eleven meets Sicario, which I feel um, sums up perfectly and sign me up. Um, it's very propulsive and a gripping read. Um, we have Victor, who's a really sincere but funny narrator. He doesn't seem to have a record of his past when he meets his new employer. Um, he gets hired and He's kind of a helping, a hired hand to do dirty work. Um, and only he and his sister know that he's wanted by many. And together, uh, his boss, who has no idea, they break into a storage unit containing possessions of a recently deported, um, the recently deported, and they've been pocketing the stuff we're selling. So they break into this storage unit that has everything. And amid them, they find a gem that's rare and valuable enough to change their whole life, their fortunes. Um, thankfully, the owner left a, the former owner left a book of cryptic notes, including the name of a gemstone dealer in Mexico City. So they're gonna go on the journey to, to get the money for this. And so they cross the Southern border and then they realize very quickly that the gym is wrapped up in a much larger scheme that <laughs> they're just walking into. And now they, um, might need Victor's talents, the ones that maybe got him in trouble in the first place, uh, that might that might come in handy now. 
Um, so Nia wanted to write a heist novel with a fresh cast of characters who were all differing in their strengths and their weaknesses. And he also wanted a heist novel to have more, uh, more realistic um, but still exciting capers. And so um, like, you know, ones readers could kind of relate to as opposed to this like tech saggy, savvy, one of the high stories where it's like, you know, typing on the computer, I'm in, you know, like something someone could relate to more. And it's full of puzzles that the characters have to solve. Um, Daniel's interest in the puzzles grew out of his relationship with his sister, um, who's a game designer and designed puzzles her entire life. And um, he's also, Daniel's also a translator. And he says that knowing another language really helps you gain more empathy and understanding of different cultures. So there's a lot of things um, outside of the surface level of this book, which is just a really fun, gripping read with a lot of fun puzzles and heist. I always love a heist. I don't know what it is about a heist, but I love a heist. Um, it's super smart, fast paced, and you also get this vivid Mexico City backdrop that feels really global. Um, it explores the ways the US and China are competing for power and influence. So that's Take No Dames by Daniel Nia. And then I just want to quickly talk a little bit about Hello Molly by Molly Shannon, who was just at uh, Live, Learn, X. She spoke with Cynthia Diapri Sweeney, and it was a fabulous event. So, so great. Um, her book was, this is her memoir. I have to say, when you see Molly Shannon, I know I did. I thought, oh, that's going to be hilarious because she's from SNL and she does all these funny roles. But she um, talks a lot about how she can get really serious and how she doesn't mind that. Like her training was uh, um, in acting, you know, not necessarily comedy. And so she really likes to see the truth of people and that, that comedy kind of comes out later, but like at the end of the day, she's like, I need to believe in these people and I need to love them and show them. And so in that seriousness, she kind of said it's because, you know, she's had some of darker moments in her life. And in this story, um, she tells very truthfully, very honestly, her life story. And I, you know, it's not a spoiler the no, I don't want to say spoiler because it's a woman's life, but it's not a giveaway. It's the first page. Her, her, she lost her mother very young um, in an accident and several of her family members. And so she has to deal with this loss of her mother growing up, but also her relationship with her father, who's going through loss of his own. And, um, you know, it's about like family drama and family relationships and what you owe to people or what you um, are missing in your life and how you fill those holes. But with her like signature funny, funny self, like it is hilarious. Also the, um, the chapters about SNL, you'll want a computer nearby so you can look at all the skits and, and watch them as you're reading because she gives a lot of behind the scenes information. Um, so there's a lot mixed in this. She's such a hard worker too in this story. She just worked so hard to get her name out there and get to where she is. And she's so thankful for everything. Um, and she also is a very, uh, has a big reverence for librarians. And so we're very excited to know that she's the National Library Week um, speaker this year. And so she, she has written this lovely book, but also just, you're going to see it everywhere. And she loves libraries. And so we just wanted to kind of highlight this Echo book that's coming out in April for you because we're all big fans. Big fans. And not only us, I mean, it got starred uh, yeah. reviews from book list and yeah. uh, PW. Um, yeah, I have a couple. Let's see. I'm glad. Thank you for saying that. Equal yeah. parts funny and touching a cut above most celebrity memoirs. That's Kirkus, the start of you. Told in Shannon's bright, irreverent voice. His memoirs, equal parts touching and hilarious, a real insight into the mind of a comedic genius. That's a book list start review. Surprisingly raw and personal account. Extreme, supremely inspiring. The soul leave fans astonished. That's a PW hmm. starred review. Like that's just the starred reviews. We also have like love from Amy Schumer, Aubrey Plaza, Aquafina, Adam Sandler. I mean, you know, just a couple of people you might've heard of. Um, I think that the main theme though, with all of these are that it's everything you want in a memoir about someone you love and see on screen and think, you know, you feel like you know them, they're celebrity, but it's so much more than that. And it's one of the most honest loving from a place of the most love and, and courageous story to tell about her family and how she's coming to terms with their relationships growing up and, and currently as well. But um, that's kind of the, 
the general theme in all of these quotes. Like it's really funny and lovely and she's hilarious, but it really is an honest memoir that is just beautiful. Um, yeah. Um, and she did, as Lainey said, she did the a wonderful interview with Cynthia D. Pre Sweeney. So I'm sure that if you, um, we're trying to get the link to that uh, from LLX. And, uh, but if you went to uh, LLX, you can um, access it still with your registration. Um, so uh, let's see, I think we have uh, answered everything. Um, I think know. there's a question about the audio for Hello Molly. I am going to find an answer for you. I just sent a question. I was so here's what I was doing. I was stretching out my chatter as I was texting because I don't know the answer to the question. So yeah, I I know we have an audio book, an ALC coming up, and it's supposed to be the first of February. If it's not up already, it should be very soon. I right, know we did I, that at our 13, our February 13th, I mean, our January 13th buzz. I don't know about Molly reading, I'm sure, but I don't, I, I'm not positive, so. If you hang out for mere minutes, I bet you we'll get that answer because we don't want to tell you the wrong thing. So, um, and if you know what, if you got to go, we'll put it in the chat, but um, yeah, yeah we'll see. find out. Um, yes, Vicki, yes, the hour did just fly by. This was super fun for us. Um, oh, just know? on hc.com, read by Molly Shannon. Oh, perfect. And so, question answered. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lainey. Um, oh, yes, Essie, I want to mention next, next week. Ugh. So, next week, thank you, Essie. Next week, two o'clock, we're going to have... Shelby Van Pelt, author of Remarkably Bright Creatures, here live with us to answer all your questions. I mean, this is the cool thing about this galley club. You get the book ahead of time because it's not a book, it's a galley. You get to meet the team that worked on the book and you get to meet the author and ask all the questions. So it's going to be a lot of fun and she's just lovely. So um, I can't wait to chat with her and I can't wait for you all to bring your questions and you know tell her what you think and ask her questions and it's going to be really cool so that's going to be here Facebook live next Tuesday at two o'clock eastern time thank you Essie is there anything else I have forgotten in my adult <laughs> brain <laughs> there was a question about the fruit punch galley because it's because uh, it is I'm not sure we will double check for you and we'll put the answer answer in the comments because it's not up yet. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Had fun today. Thank you, Janet. It's great that you joined us and we look forward to next week. We look forward to seeing you next week. It's good to have a Cyrano. <laughs> oh my God, Jennifer Winberry, you are hilarious. And it's true. Um, oh my God, that is hilarious. It's good to have a Cyrano. I love that. Um, oh my God, this is so funny. Okay, thanks for everything. Had fun. Can't wait to meet Shelby. Yes, good. Yippee. All right, if we haven't um, answered any of your questions, you know how to find us. Um, share this with your friends. Let them know this is a cool book, a cool read. And uh, you can, um, all the links are there on how to find it. Hold on, Sarah knows right. I me do again. have one. Do you, I, <laughs> I have an answer too, so go ahead. What is it? Fruit Punch, the galley is due in March. So hopefully in early March, we will have a galley for you. There you go. Yeah, this was cool. And I love the beginning of our, I love our little video. Book buzz, happy guys, book buzz, check it out. Mm -hmm. We paid $300 for that song about 20 years ago. I think we've gotten our use out of it. It's on the podcast. Oh my God, so funny. All right, well, thank you all so much for, for listening and learning. And we're so excited about this. So uh, we hope you are too. And we hope that you find these additional books interesting. You know, we're just trying to, you know, focus on one book, learn a lot about uh, one book and a little about some other books. So there we go. So we hope to see you next Tuesday. 
And until then, be well, take good care. Any Essie? Nice job. This was fun. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, all.